Hi, and thank you for joining us for the International Symposium on Human Identifications video series. Today we have a special guest, uh, Olivia McCarter. Olivia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, then we can talk about all of the news attention that you've been getting lately. All right. Um, my name is Olivia McCarter. I am 19 years old. I am an anthropology major at the University of South Alabama. I'm a sophomore currently. Um, I am also a senior intern at a forensic genealogy company called Redgrave Research Forensic Services based in Massachusetts. I was approached by the anthropology head at my school, uh, Dr. Philip Carr. He asked me if I would do an interview with the media department at my school. And once I did that and it came out, all of the news uh, media attention shot off from there. And um, I've gotten a lot of media requests, including a lot of stuff locally. And they want to continue um, to have me on segments with local cases that I can get because I am doing a lot of local things currently. And I've gotten um, approached by Ishii um, and then the district attorney's office also. Uh, it's been kind of crazy lately for me. And I'm also doing 16 credit hours a semester. So just a little bit on your plate, not too much, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us for the viewers who are watching who don't know what's been going on, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the cases that you've been working on and the attention they've been getting? Sure. So I started um, at Redgrave Research Forensic Services as an intern in March of 2020. And I was put on a case from uh, Missouri, a John Doe that had washed up in a field um, out of the Missouri River in 1979. And we solved that case in four days. Um, he was identified as, his name is Harry. And Harry's case really sparked my interest in forensic genealogy, that this is the case that made me know that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Um, I, before that, I had just wanted to do it, you know, as a student and, and, and just kind of get to know the field a little bit. But once I solved Harry's case, it became like an addiction. And um, I, I, I've never looked back. So after Harry, we solved um, the, the 1984 rape and murder of nine-year-old Christine Jessup from Queensville, Ontario. Um, that case took six months to solve. And for most of that six months, it was just me and three other people solving this case and just bouncing theories off of each other's heads. Um, and that case taught me a lot about genealogy and um, the aftermath also taught me a lot about, you know, um, what happens during these perpetrator cases, what happens after, what happens, because um, I'm also a criminal justice minor. So that was really interesting for me to see. And then my most recent case was in my own backyard, basically. Um, that was the case of the Delta Dawn Jane Doe. She was an 18 month old baby girl found thrown off a bridge in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Um, and we received that case in April of 2020 and had it solved in June. Um, and I was able to go visit um, her gravesite during the entire process. And uh, um, after she was identified, I was able to talk to her family members and I kept in contact with the sheriff's office. And I basically said, I want to do more of your cases here. And uh, I think, you know, stuff's happening. So uh, I think it'll be a great partnership starting with Alicia. All right. Well, that's, um, that is, uh, that's really remarkable. Did you know when you took on this internship that this is what it would be like? I did not. I had wanted to take on the internship. I was interested in genetic genealogy and forensic genealogy just from watching um, all of these genealogists work. Uh, I, I had been a fan of Anthony and Lee Redgrave. Uh, I'd probably been their biggest supporter and I befriended them. And I started talking to them and have told them that I was an anthropology student. I was 18 at the time. I was a freshman in college. And I said, this is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about unidentified remains. This is what I want to do. I want to be a forensic anthropologist. And they, they, they said, would you take an internship and let us train you through the forensic genealogy training course? And obviously I said yes, because these two people were my heroes. 
And um, I, I did not think that I would be so emotionally involved in my cases. I did not think that. I do not consider myself a very emotional person um, until I, I got these cases and solved them and, you know, love somebody without knowing their name. That's a, that's a really remarkable, the way you just put that is remarkable. And I have heard that from so many other people we've talked to who work in the field. And it's been really interesting to watch forensic genetic genealogy grow from its origins and it's exploded. What kind of emotions were you going through on some of these cases? So the first case I was ever put on was the murder and rape case of Christine Jessup, a nine-year-old girl brutally killed in Queensville, Ontario in 1984. Before being placed on the case, Anthony and Lee Redgrave sat me down and asked me if this would be something I was okay with working on. I, of course, said that I was okay with it, and since I want to be a forensic anthropologist, I would have to get used to cases like these, especially ones involving children and babies. This case was so difficult for all of us emotionally. Personally, I would forget to eat and sleep because I was working on finding out who did this horrible thing to this little girl who was not that much younger than me. We only have, you know, a, a 10 year age difference. I would work at ungodly hours of the day and not stop working until I was about to pass out from exhaustion. The only thing that kept me from losing sight of myself during this time was my team. My team makes it a point to take care of each other. We take breaks and we do things like watch a TV show or a movie once a week together to get away from the horrible things that we see every day. Not a lot of other companies do this, but on our team, we are family and we care about each other. These are some of the best friends that I have ever had. It was really hard for me to, you know, come from being a freshman in college to working on murder cases like the Delta Dawn case. And that was the hardest case that I've ever had to work on. I live 15 minutes away from where she was found and where she was buried. I had visited her gravesite before I became a genealogist just because somebody had to remember. And, and when we got her case, I threw myself into the research and I also began to visit her gravesite again, which had become very overgrown and forgotten. I remember when I saw what it looked like, I sat beside the headstone and I cried. And I made a vow that second to never ever let this little girl be forgotten again. My parents and I went to the gravesite of her and the unidentified baby next to her and cleaned it up. We, we took some weed eaters and such and, and cleaned it up. And I now go very often to her place of flowers and make sure that it's clean and, and, and doesn't look overgrown ever again. And one of the greatest moments of my career was a week after we saw her case, I went to the gravesite again and I got to say her name to her. And then I realized this is the first time that anyone has called her by her own name in 40 years. During the research for the case, I began to think of the child as my own. I know it sounds strange, but she was a child and at the time she was alone. She didn't have a family to visit her or love her. My team was that family. We cared for her. And when we found out what her name was, it was Alicia Ann Heinrich. My team got into a video call together and cried. We cried for her in the life that she could never live. And we cried for her mother whose remains have never been found. I became so attached to this case and all of the other cases that I view myself as their own family until we identified their biological family. And I also keep framed photographs of all of our solved cases on my mantle. And I have tattoos for most of my cases so that they can be with me for the rest of my life. I have solved three cases so far this um, last year, and they all own a piece of my heart. Oh, Olivia, that's just, I can't even, wow, wow. I had no, I, I, I didn't know about the tattoos and, and certainly I had read a lot about how emotional and how connected. This must be a lot for you. I don't think, how could you have predicted that doing this work? And how did you manage that staying up all night and then, you know, trying to also focus on schoolwork and everything else that you need to do? It's been crazy, but these cases are just so important to me. Um, you know, not a lot of people care about these people anymore. Like Harry, Harry was my first John Doe case that we solved. And, and there was only a, a handful of people that cared about him. Who, who knew that these bones were there and that he was unidentified and cared that and wanted him to find his name. And I stayed up for three days straight. Me, Anthony and Lee sat on a Zoom call for three days straight with the anthropologist and we solved it in four days. And um, uh, the anthropologist called his, his family the next day and um, 
I still keep in touch with his family, actually. Um, I talk to them a lot, actually. They follow all of my genealogy stuff and, and they, they give me updates. Um, they had the funeral back in July and he got his headstone two weeks ago and they, they sent me pictures and, and you know, it, it, it's still very emotional for me to talk about that case. We solved it back in April. It's almost been a year. And, and then when I saw his headstone two weeks ago, I was in the car and I just started to cry because, you know, we did that. Nobody else did that. That was us. That was me and my team. And uh, I think I'll, I'll for, forever be connected to this man's family and him and, and, and the Red Graves for, you know, all of these cases that we've been on. That's amazing. What, what was the, what was the most surprising to you? You know, I mean, I'm sure you had preconceived notions of what this was going to be like when you went into the internship and started working with them. What surprised you? What changed over time? How does this affect how you go forward? It really surprised me how the different genealogy companies treat each other. Um, I think like a lot of fields, it's very competitive. It's such a new field that people can just be mean to each other. And the Redgraves and I don't like that. We, we make it a point to, to be friends with these other genealogy companies because the, the competitiveness, the, the fame, the notoriety, that does not matter. What matters is that these cases get solved and there's enough for everyone. There is 40,000 unidentified remains in the United States. There is enough to go around. We do not need to fight over the most notorious cases. And I make it a point, I have befriended other genealogists with companies. And when they get assaulted, I'll reach out to them and, and congratulate them and make sure that they're okay. And they do the same with me. That's what matters is, you know, it's taking care of each other. And what was so surprising to me is just, yeah, it's just the, the competitiveness and just the meanness that can be out there. Um, you are going to love Ishi because uh, not being in the field, but having attended and worked with them for 10 years, the way people come together and help each other and are doing it in the service of, of justice and, and making things better for people. It is a remarkable industry. Yes, I, that is that is not the first time I've heard that. And I think you will just continue to see that, which is pretty amazing. Are you working on any cases now? I have a few cases in the pipeline that I can't talk about just yet, but we recently announced the case of Preble County Penny. We are teaming up with the detective Adam Turner of the Shelby Police Department in Ohio to identify a 30 to 50 year old Jane Doe found in Preble County in 1968. Detective Turner had this Jane Doe exhumed in 2019 to be compared against a missing persons case that he had been working on for years, the case of Mary Jane Croft Van Gilder, who went missing from Ohio in 1945. And whether or not Preble County Penny is Mary Jane or not, she will be identified and hopefully Mary Jane Van Gilder will be located and brought back to her waiting family. So you still have your work cut out for you. How are you going to manage that with the next semester? <laughs> so this semester, um, it's my second semester of my sophomore year. I'm taking 16 credit hours. That's um, I have, I mean, uh, and a lot of them are level 300 courses, which is, you know, not very common for a sophomore, but I wanted to do it and just get them out of the way. I'm tired of doing general education. I want to be taking a level 300 anthropology courses and level 300 criminal justice courses. And um, it's a lot right now. I have been getting, I started, you know, the semester last week and that's when all of the news broke and, and I've been getting all of this media attention. I mean, I've had to leave class early to, because somebody was you know, a, 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 I've had to leave class early because a news person messaged me and was like, let's do something right now. And then I was on TV like an hour later. And it's just been really crazy. I, I'm not used to all of this. I'm 19 years old. Uh, I can't, I, you know, I'm not a superhero. Well, you are definitely getting some on the job training here on how that works. And, uh, and just uh, personally, you know, you can, you can control when and how you want to do that as well. So you can, you can, uh, if you need to set some boundaries, that's okay too. <laughs> Me, but honestly, it's kind of fun. So. <laughs> And honestly, people love reading about it and hearing about it. And uh, we love telling these stories every year. So yes, I, I would like you to still keep talking to everybody if you can, but <laughs> within reason so that you're okay too. <laughs> 
And I hear you're probably going to be joining us in Orlando in September for our next Ishii event as a student ambassador, possibly. Do I have that right? Yes, they um, they messaged Anthony and Lee Redgrave uh, the other day and asked if I would apply. And uh, obviously I am. I think that would be a lot of fun. It's just, it's just in Orlando and um, I live in Alabama. So it's just, you know, Easy. next thing is over. And I'm really excited actually. Um, I hope I get to go because I've never met a lot of the genealogists um, that I talk to. I've never met them in person. And I really want to meet them because, you know, I, I've been a supporter of them for years and, uh, and this, I, I really want to go to all the workshops and uh, learn more about forensic science and all the people in the field and Ishii because I'm kind of new to Ishii actually. Um, I, I watched a couple of videos last year because Anthony and uh, Dr. Margaret Press from the DNA Doe Project were interviewed. Um, they did a presentation about Joseph Henry Loveless. Uh, the John Doe found in 1979, who turned out to be a wanted criminal, killed in 1916. So um, watching that and knowing sort of that's what Ishii does and is interested in, it's what I'm interested in too. So I'm very excited. I think you'll have an amazing time. Forensic genealogy, genetic genealogy has been one of the main topics, areas of focus for years now. And so um, it's an incredible group. It is really, I feel honored. It's luminaries. It's the who's who of that world. So if there is anyone you want to meet, there's a very good chance you could sit down with them there. And I'm happy that we have the possibly the chance to be in person again after doing it virtually last year. It'll be great. So uh, now what about your personal plans? I know you're just a sophomore, but what do you want to do after graduation? And how has the work you've been doing impacted that plan? So although I am a forensic genetic genealogist, I still want to pursue my forensic anthropology education. Um, I want to get my bachelor's degree and later get my master's degree and go get my doctorate as well. And I want to continue to work with law enforcement to uh, identify remains and solve their cold cases. Um, as I said, there are about 40,000 John and Jane Doe's in the United States. My dream is to have every single one of those victims identified and returned to their family, and I will not stop until they are. A lot of people ask me if I'm going to quit school because I've already done a lot within my career, but anthropology and forensic genealogy sort of go hand in hand. Our team, our team has forensic anthropologists like Dr. Amy Michael that work with us to help us on anthropological estimations about the cases we are working on. So I would like to do both of those things and solve as many cases as possible. I have no doubt you will. And we're going to continue to hear your name and hopefully I'll be interviewing you every year. Um, how about, you know, I, I think what is really compelling to a lot of people and, and all the, and why you're getting so much media attention is, I mean, you are very young, you're just getting started and you've had this remarkable opportunity to work together to solve some cold cases. Do you think that's inspiring some other young people to get into the field or are there uh, things that uh, we can all be doing to encourage people to consider it? Um, I hope it's encouraging a lot of younger people to, to pursue the forensic science field. And I've gotten a lot of messages from people in the anthropology department in my school that are interested in what I do and just want to talk with me about, about how they can do it too. And I mean, Nothing is impossible. I'm only 19 years old and I started this, you know, less than a year ago. And a year ago, I was a freshman in college ready to drop out of school because I didn't think that my future was going to go anywhere in the forensic science field. And then I met Anthony and Lee Redgrave and uh, they changed my life. They, uh, they're my heroes and they're two of the very bestest friends I've ever had in my entire life. And Anthony taught me everything. I did not have a genealogy background. I um, was not adopted. I had never worked on any adoption cases. I was just an anthropology student at some small school in Southern Alabama. And Anthony, you know, he took a chance on me. Obviously, I've never done this before. And um, I, I'd like to think that, that that chance paid off for him. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if you make if if you make connections and you go out there and do these things, you can do it. That's what I did. That's um, that's actually a beautiful story. It's very inspiring. Um, I think that 
says a lot when you, I had no idea that, you know, you were considering uh, dropping out, uh, you know, this was an opportunity to do something different. Given all that, any advice for students who are sort of in that place right now and struggling? Don't give up, you know? Um, I was about to give up. I was ready. And then I met Anthony and Lee and uh, just kind of turned my life around. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I met a bunch of amazing professors in the criminal justice and anthropology department who who kept me in school and, and helped me they guided me, you know, towards the right path. And uh, just just make friends with your professors, um, ask for help, uh, make connections, network. That's, you know, what I did. Well, we are so happy to talk to you today and we can't wait to have you at Ishii next year. Um, yes, and see what remarkable things you do next. So you definitely have to keep us posted. Of course. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Olivia. We really appreciate your time and have a wonderful day.